Okay, so we've been talking a lot about capturing biodiversity data. And we've kind of been talking about it for almost a week and a half now. So we've thought a lot about you have a museum full of information. How do you go about making that information digital? And how do you go about making that information useful for science? What we haven't talked about so much is where the, that museum full of information is likely to be. So I just wanted to think a little bit with you about this topic, which is hotspots of biodiversity versus hotspots of biodiversity data. Many of you come from places that are very easily characterized as hotspots of biodiversity. But where are the data? We had one very nice example at the University of Ghana of the hotspot of biodiversity data being pretty close to the hotspot of biodiversity. But if we could step back and look at the whole Earth and see density of biodiversity data, what would we see? You guys already know the, the answers to these questions. But it's, it's worthwhile going through and thinking a bit more quantitatively about these questions. So let's just think a bit. We all know that biodiversity is concentrated in the tropics. And there are exceptions to that. For example, Madagascar is pretty far from the equator and yet is a pretty amazing focus of biodiversity. Um, but what we do know is that the really big storehouses of biodiversity information tend not to be in the tropics. They tend to be in North America and Western Europe. And this contrast comes from a whole suite of different causes. Certainly colonial history is involved, historical accident, we could talk about economic imperialism. We can talk about essentially opportunity driven by, by economic prosperity. We can talk about political stability. It's a, it's a panoply of, of causes, but the, the contrast is there. So there's a picture of vertebrate diversity worldwide, and you see what you pretty much knew, okay? which is to say this band of diversity that goes across tropical latitudes. There's some really interesting things. Notice that it kind of bends upward. Okay, there's really neat stuff in here. And that's, this is the, the whole science of macroecology. You know, what dri drives diversity? Um, and then this is a view of the world by GDP, gross domestic product. So this is essentially a view of the world uh, in terms of, of economic activity. And if I go back and forth, you can see some pretty serious contrasts. So I just did a little bit of playing to look for that contrast between biodiversity and economic prosperity. And you can see this is in terms of number of breeding bird species. You can see really high numbers at really low numbers for GDP. If I put on some lines to guide your eyes a bit, it helps a bit. We can see species poor countries, this end of the spectrum, across all GDP values. But we see species rich countries chiefly in uh, countries with lower economic activity. This is not my favorite recent published study, um, but it had a very interesting analysis in it. Uh, we, can, we can analyze this paper in quite a bit of detail, but let's not. Um, but it's titled Mapping the Diversity of Tropical Insects, Species Richness, and Inventory Completeness of Sphingid Moths in Africa. 
And essentially what they, pre what they present is a series of cross-Africa analyses. This is the number of records in all of these where you see red, it's high values. So here we have lots and lots of records from just a few sites across Africa. Observed species richness, if you focus your eyes on those two maps, you'll see they show much the same pattern, which is to say well-sampled localities, let's see, this one, correspond to localities where more species have been detected. That makes a lot of sense. If a, if a site has few or no specimens, you can't really get many species detected, right? Now, number C, or map C, is an estimate of species richness. And essentially what they've done here is to rarify um, records down to 25. So if you have a, you know, a site where you've got a thousand records, maybe it's here, what you do is you randomly subsample those thousand records down to 25 and you look at the species richness amongst the sites based on sets of 25 records. And so essentially what you're seeing is that all of these deep blue areas have 25 or fewer records, and so they can't be involved in this calculation. So this is a calculation for the relatively well sampled sites, how many species would be represented amongst 25 specimens. And you can see the rarefied species richness doesn't go up to 25, okay? And then this is another estimate that approaches the same sort of thing. It's an asymptotic, asymptotic estimate of total species richness. Um, and these are shown on the same scale, okay? So essentially what this, this group of authors did was to take the existing biodiversity data translate that into number of species, and then use the data to make two guesses at likely final species richness. Now you can think immediately of some problems with this. For example, here, maybe I did like a, you know, a one of everything, a stamp collection where you just get one of each species. Maybe I had 20 individuals and it was 20 different species. Well, that's immediately going to produce a really red pixel in this uh, map. So we can see some problems, and I'll come back to some other problems, but this is, this is an interesting analysis across Africa of, of one group of moths. Now, as you know, Africa is a, is a patchwork of different colonial origins. Um, and so one of the things that they included was the colonial power as of 1919, so as of the First World War. And so essentially what they did was they used these maps, essentially contrasting this with this, they used these maps to guess at inventory completeness. So what did they do? They took these points and they interpolated. So now they have a a full map of Africa with a guess at species richness. And then they took this map and divided it by this map, pixel by pixel. And so if you have you know, five species known from a site, but 500 expected, then you would have a completeness value of 1%. But if you have 100 species known from a site where you expect 100 and 10 species, then you're most of the way done. A very complete inventory. So, they use that to get a map of, of inventory completeness across the continent, and then the percent completeness can very easily be uh, translated into how many species are missing. Okay? And then they ask, what factors, pixel by pixel across the map of Africa, what factors generate a relatively complete 
inventory. And essentially all I want you to see is effects of uh, colonial power, effects of population, effects of um, transportation. Essentially lots of things lead to a well sampled or a poorly sampled view of this taxon. Now if I get going on the science behind it, I don't like it at all. For example, I noticed that one of the strongest relationships was a Portuguese colonial origin. And what I noticed was that this unseen species has this very solid blob that coincides with Mozambique. And what that brought to my mind is that those may not be independent, okay? So that may count as a bunch of pixels. It does count as a bunch of pixels in this analysis, but really they're spatially autocorrelated and so they're not independent. And probably if you looked at this map, taking into account how independent each pixel is from, from the next one over, you might come to very different conclusions. So I don't, I don't want to get into the, the real details of their analysis, but it's interesting in that it shows a whole bunch of um, influences on both the species diversity known and how much work there is to do. Here's another exploration along the same sorts of lines, uh, the Biodiversity Informatics Potential Index. Um, and essentially, you know, seeks to fulfill a prioritization role. Um, we propose that the potential for biodiversity informatics, informatics, not biodiversity, be assessed through three concepts. The intrinsic biodiversity potential, so that's bi biodiversity richness. The capacity to generate in the country, the capacity to generate biodiversity records and the technical infrastructure within the country. So this is right away going to be kind of a strange um, index. And here's a representation where they show those, um, those, those axes and they sort different countries out. Here you have Brazil and Australia and Bolivia. And here they're showing different drivers. So we have very um, strong drivers in terms of economic and financial power, also in terms of the biodiversity itself and uh, environmental indicators. Again, these are ex explorations country by country. And essentially this is how they show, um, this is how they show their biodiversity potential index. Blue is good and red is bad. And you kind of notice one, con one continent that jumps off the map at you. And I actually disagree with this index. I disagreed with it before it was published. Um, this is not an indication of potential. This might be the most important point of this talk. This isn't an index of potential. This is a, matter, a measure of progress so far. And so you kind of see South Africa, and then everything else is North America, parts of South America, Western Europe, and Australia. This is a, this is a measure of, of track record so far, but I don't think, and the wonderful interactions that I've had with you all and, and several other groups like you all, suggests to me that the potential is a very, very different animal or plant which is to say, I see Africa and other parts of Latin America as full of potential. And this index, essentially, to my eye, instead recovers achievement to date, not potential into the future. So we did a little playing with the biggest biodiversity data network. You can see GBIF has 422 million records online that relate to approximately 1.4 million species, 14,000 data sets, 500 some data publishers. Okay, it's a pretty impressive 
um, data stash. Certainly we could talk about their attention to fitness for use and data quality, but this is an impressive amount of data. And so with Jorge Soberon in, at the University of Kansas, um, we started exploring essentially how much data does a country provide to other countries versus how much data does a country receive from other countries. And you get a very, very interesting result. There's a whole set of countries or entities geographically that essentially serve nothing. So Antarctica, the Atlantic Islands, Indian Ocean Islands, and Greenland. There are data, but they come from somewhere else. And those countries are not serving any data to other countries. Then there's this middle group, and there we see Asian and African countries. And essentially what they're doing is they are Yes, providing some data to other countries. Sorry, some data to other countries, but they're receiving quite a bit more. Okay, and that reflects that imbalance of where the information is. And then finally, we have a bunch of countries that are essentially setting this relationship of data that exists for that country versus data that that country provides to others. Okay? So this is an interesting spectrum and when we talk about biodiversity informatics potential, I think we're talking about this going up. So then we started looking at that same data set geographically. And so this is it's keyed only to the capital cities of countries. Um, but essentially this is the flow of data regarding Africa. And with one exception that I'll point out to you in a moment, essentially all the flow is from outside in. Okay? But what you can see is a lot of data coming in from the US, and the major contributor there is VertNet. And you can see a fair amount of data flowing in from Europe. The one exception is this, which is a pretty interesting exception. I'll come back to that. So from Europe, you can see that the big suppliers are the places that you might imagine. France, Germany, and um, Belgium. This is a little bit weird, isn't it? Remember that map of colonial powers. What's happening here? From the Africa side, we see data coming in from all sides. But really the only Africa data that we see flowing is out of South Africa. Now, as, as Alex polishes up the University of Ghana data set, you guys saw yesterday that there's a lot of information in there, not just about Ghana, but about all of West Africa and even about Ethiopia. So biodiversity informatics potential, I think, is actually quite a bit bigger <coughs> when you talk about moving up in the previous graph that I showed you, and in this, showing more interconnections rather than just unidirectional flow. So just to sum up, Biodiversity and biodiversity information show opposite patterns. They're very complex sets of factors that create these contrasts. I don't believe that under development presently in biodiversity informatics translates into zero opportunity. Rather, if you guys and people like you guys are creative, there's an enormous amount of potential. So that's just a commentary about, about biodiversity information and biodiversity. Any comments, any questions, any thoughts? Anybody ready for a break?